um, uh, field. So we're really excited to have him join us, uh, actually from Australia, but Rhea are actually based in Washington, DC, I think. So welcome, Philippe. Thank you so much. Um, just want to make sure you're currently seeing my presentation, right? We are indeed. Perfect. It's the, the number one question in 2020, I think. Um, but yeah, perfect. Thank you so much, Alison, for, for the introduction. Um, you almost had it right. Uh, I work for the Rarest Center for Behavior and the Environment. It's a very long name. Don't worry about it. Um, but yeah, basically, you can think of my role as quite different, actually, to the other people that presented today. Uh, so unlike actually most people here, um, my expertise is not in ag, it's not in pesticides, insecticides. Um, I actually used to be a behavioral neuroscientist, um, and so I decided to switch into conservation, um, and now I work basically in translating scientific evidence about behavior um, into conservation programs. Um, and that is what the Center for Behavior and the Environment does. Uh, so I do this, part of, this work as part of RARE. Um, that's a conservation NGO. We've been around for about 45 years. We've led hundreds of behavior change campaigns um, in Asia, South America, um, Africa. So that's kind of the perspective I take. And it's going to be super interesting, especially having heard the three other presentations. I'm going to take a bit of a higher level um, approach and just explain to you not how to generate necessarily the insight, but how to actually use the behavioral insights to then create a program, um, giving you the example of what we have in South America. Um, so just a bit more background, basically the Center for Behavior and the Environment launched in 2017, um, and it was kind of the first ever think tank, or for those familiar, the, the word nudge unit uh, dedicated to conservation and the environment. And so since then, we've now really expanded into building evidence. Um, so we do a lot of research on our end, but also we do a lot of knowledge propagation and translation for other folks. Uh, so a lot of training, a lot of expertise building. And our main goal, um, which ties it really well with the last presentation, is really to get everyone to be a bit more familiar and to realize that there's not just three levers of behavior change. So a lot of us will think of material incentives, uh, rules and regulations, or information. So kind of the pay them, stop them, or tell them model. Um, and our real focus is to get people to Sure, keep using those ones, but also be aware that there are three other behavioral levers that are super important, and those are emotional appeals, social influences, and choice architecture. And they all tie in with what we've been talking about to earlier today. Um, so before I go into our case study of what our program is, I also want to highlight three high-level insights uh, that are going to be quite important. I wish everyone remembers these. Um, so basically, behavioral insights that are relevant, especially for farmers. Um, and these are going to be the first one that we have a limited or bound cognitive resource. Um, our brain is biologically based, it's not infinite, um, and so it has to maximize specific things in the environment to be able to be as efficient as it is. Um, so we tend to focus on things that are more in the moment. And so we heard the word satisfying earlier. Uh, basically, we always try to, to get the best of a situation, but not necessarily the most out of every situation. And we're going to be really putting our attention on what is salient at that time. Um, the second thing that has been established in the literature is that we are very uncertainty averse. Um, and here I'm going to make a distinction between risk and ambiguity. Uh, we talked a little bit about risk aversion earlier. I agree, it's not necessarily the, the problem in every situation, uh, but ambiguity is a situation where you don't know what the probabilities of something happening are. So you're just wholly unaware of basically the uncertainty of a situation. And risk and ambiguity are going to be two main drivers of people not doing something. Um, and then the final thing that I want everyone to keep in mind for today is that we are social beings. Um, there's the word conformity bias, which basically refers to our inherent need to conform to the behavior of others and to use others in our environment as kind of indicators of what we should be doing. Um, so if everyone else is doing something, maybe I should do it too. That's kind of the rule of thumb. Uh, we are social beings. And so conformity bias and social norms are going to be very important when thinking about using behavioral science to reinforce or to design programs from the ground up. With that said, I'm going to jump directly into our Lands for Life program. Um, so Lands for Life is a relatively novel program for RARE. Um, we are based in South America and Colombia. And the whole goal of the program basically is to align agricultural ecosystems, um, agricultural productivity with ecosystem productivity, sorry. Um, and so we work with small to medium scale Colombian farmers. Um, so again, step it back from Asia, but here you'll see kind of the logic that uh, I want everyone to take away. 
Um, so we work in Norte de Santander. Um, it's a province in the upper right part of Colombia. I'm sure everyone can see it on the, on the map. It's right on the border of Venezuela. Um, and so we started our program there and now we are expanding actually towards the Amazon. Uh, but I'll be showing you basically the insights that we got from that initial province um, from where we shaped our thinking of the program. So the simplest problem we could think of um, when getting there was that we're trying to basically switch some farming behaviors from what is currently being done to some novel behaviors that are not necessarily as proven for farmers. Uh, so on the left, we have basically production choices that they're familiar with and over-reliance on chemical fertilizers, pesticides here also, over-irrigation, and the addition of manure to their soil before having compost of it. And then on the right, we have production choices that are sustainable but unfamiliar. So using only as much fertilizer as you need, only as much water as you need, and making sure that the materials you incorporate in your soil are properly composted. So the sustainable practices on the right are actually better for the farmers. It's in their interest to do that on a purely economic sense, um, but they don't. And so when we're looking at this objectively, um, they would have better returns, they would have better costs, everything would be better. Also collectively, um, more people adopt sustainable practices, more people in the community would benefit. But unfortunately, that is not what we see. Um, over and over and over, we see people really sticking to those left side behaviors, which are what they're familiar with and what they've been doing for generations. Um, when we got to Norte de Santander, we really wanted to understand why is this happening? Because previous NGOs in the area had gone in, um, had trained a lot of farmers to do something. So they had a small proportion of farmers that were farming perfectly um, using sustainable practices. But then unfortunately, as time went by, because they saw that other people weren't joining in, they kind of felt, unsure about the practices and dropped out. Um, so we really wanted to understand, okay, what are the barriers, the psychological barriers here at play um, beyond the material barriers that you might have? So going into this, uh, we found that confirmation bias was a big problem in the area. And so that is really the, the, the sense that what you've been doing, you will use your past experience to confirm your own point of view. Um, so a lot of time farmers will see that production is going down. Um, there is a problem here, especially in the Andes uh, with climate change, that potentially the weather is getting a bit more variable. Uh, it's not as intense as it sounds, but farmers will always blame climate change for their problems. That's something we found very often um, in this part of Colombia. Um, so instead of looking at their own use of fertilizers, their own use of pesticides, they relied on finding external reasons for why their production may be going down. So they always confirm their own viewpoint with the data they were looking at. And um, the other thing is that they're present biased. Um, so investment right now, even if it's for the future, seems kind of a loss for them. Um, they don't want to invest right away because that's money they could have right now, even though they could save their production for later. The next thing we saw is that they're very ambiguity averse. And so in this case, farmers, it's not necessarily about risk, it's really they don't necessarily understand the outcomes that they could get from adopting new techniques. And um, so they've seen a lot of different information coming up from different NGOs, different uh, information sources, and it's just very unclear to them how significant the benefits could be, or if it's even a cost, because some people have also been spreading that information. And finally, the last thing that we saw in the area is that intensive agriculture, and so those old techniques was really the norm. And so even if you switched, the norm everyone around you was not. And so unfortunately, because we like to conform, that led to a lot of people switching back or never wanting to adopt initially. So simplifying all of this, um, basically what we said was, when in doubt, farmers stick to what they know. And that's kind of the general guiding principle that we have um, for the Lens for Life program. And I'll explain to you why. Um, putting farmers on a resistance to ambiguity scale or a resistance to change scale has been very, very useful in structuring how we use behavioral insights and then how we use different behavioral levers to target different farmers. Um, so if you think of this as a continuum, I'm just going to broadly define farmers in through different strata. The first one would be low resistance farmers, and those would be the farmers that generally engage with NGOs. Um, they're the farmers that are most easy to, con easy to convince and they like to try new things. Um, again, broad swath of the population, but it's good to be able to identify people in their resistance to ambiguity or resistance to change um, variable. The next group that we have would be the moderate resistance farmers. 
Um, and so for those people, they need to see something succeeding before wanting to adopt it themselves. Uh, so they might be a bit more ambiguity averse, even risk averse, loss averse. Um, they just want to be really convinced that it works before trying something else. And it has to work for someone who's similar to them. And the final population we identified was really these high resistance farmers. And they're the people for whom evidence, social evidence, any kind of evidence might not actually be enough. Um, and for them, for any economists in the room, we're thinking utility terms, uh, the utility of adopting new practices is not just, it's just not enough. So you need to introduce a new cost or a new benefit to this. And the way we look at it is tr basically transforming social norms um, and creating social pressure to switch to new sustainable practices. So looking at what it looks like and looking at how it looked like historically, um, we have these three groups. And in the area, we had had a lot of campaigns that were basically recruitment type campaigns. So they would approach the farmers that were most likely to join, train these farmers, and then those ones would carry on. But you never really reached the three other groups. Then there's other types of interventions in Colombia, and those are a lot more modern, uh, usually ICT driven, so technology driven, where you just target everyone with a blanket intervention. And so you get a small percentage of everyone adopting, but if you're trying to save a landscape, that might not be enough. And so what we were thinking was, how do we get all three groups um, at minimal cost, really, or comparable cost to the other programs using behavioral science? And so what we're going to try and do is look at what are the different levers we can use. So for one, we need minimal evidence. That's probably going to be quite similar to what we used to do. For the second group, we're going to try and convince them of the benefits with social proof. So the more relevant the evidence is for them, the better it is. And for the last group, we're going to introduce social pressure. And so we do that in three different phases. And basically what we're going to do is, in the first phase, do a lot of what we've heard today, uh, simplifying the existing evidence, trying to create shortcuts and better rule of thumbs for farmers. The next step of the process is going to be to generate that social proof and make it very observable for everyone so that everyone can find someone who's similar to them who has succeeded in these practices. And then the next step is going to be to generate social pressure and by changing norms in the community. And hopefully in the end, that gets us a collective result as opposed to just one segment of the population um, switching to new practices. So going into a bit more detail, and this has been the blueprint for Lands for Life as we've started in Notre de Santander and as we've been ex uh, expanding in different areas of Colombia. Um, so in phase zero, we actually create a cohort of eager innovators uh, who will stand as model farmers and educators for the rest of the program. And in phase one, we publicly showcase their work and successes and use this to create medium resistance farmers, basically to reach medium resistance farmers into our program. Finally, in phase two, we leverage our low and medium resistance farmer, especially their numbers, um, and reach out to non-farmers to make sustainable agriculture more than just a norm in farming, it's a norm in the community. And so essentially what we are doing is what so social psychologists refer to as laying the foundations for a norm. Um, and you can think of it as a checklist where what we want to do is make things as easy and unambiguous as possible. Uh, we want to communicate the benefits to the rest of the community. We want to generate the impression that others expect compliance. So a lot of this is pro-social behavior. And so we are able to use that final little checklist point um, to reach our goal. So going to more details, um, in phase zero, Lands for Life basically offers individualized training to farmers that approach the program and we provide them with decision aids, uh, timely practice, specific advice, um, and access to our two-way messaging platform. So we have an SMS platform where we can send them nudges um, and where they can talk, contact us for help. And really what we want is that these innovators, these early innovator farmers, um, find the process as easy as possible and that we generate as much success as possible. So we really invest a lot in these early innovators. And at the end of phase zero, what we do is actually have a graduating ceremony where they are basically and celebrated in the community. They receive um, a, a little prize, a little certificate by someone important in the community. In this case, it was either the mayor or a priest. Um, and then they're also basically turned into little local celebrities, um, a bit like farmer champions, which we heard about earlier today. Um, then we have phase one, uh, which starts right after this public recognition event, uh, where we basically launch a social marketing campaign. And this social marketing campaign is to, entirely tuned to highlighting individual benefits um, of adoption by promoting the successes of farmers who have adopted 
and succeeded. So basically promoting these local celebrities, the, the early innovators. And so here the target, like as I said, are medium resistance farmers and where farmers can join the program directly at public events, uh, which we host many during this uh, second phase, or they can join through SMS. And then they actually get to attend classes taught by our early innovators. So they see people like them teaching them how to do things. Um, they also get access to the SMS platform to help ease their transition into sustainable farming. Finally, um, the last bit is our, oh, sorry, those are pictures. Yeah, so just to show you a bit what it looks like. Um, on the left, we have these peer uh, workshops that we have, and then we also have um, different recognition, um, basically inputs that they can have. So they have this agroclimatic station that makes them observable in the community, and they also get uh, their certificate when they publicly graduate. Yeah, so going into the final phase and um, for phase two, so the social marketing shifts all about highlighting individual benefits to highlighting collective benefits to the community. Um, so a growing proportion of the community is now expecting you to farm sustainably because everyone now understands the benefits of farming sustainably. So community events here are very anchored in traditional events. So we have traditional plays, songs, school activities. Don't worry, we have a team in Colombia. It's not a guy sitting in Canada that decides this. Um, and there we basically highlight the positive externalities of farming sustainably, and we continue to reinforce the, the good work that the initial farmers and adopters were doing. And so this is at this point that Lands for Life exists in communities. Um, once we've turned the initial social proof that we've generated, the what we call a descriptive norm, into social pressure, which is what we call an injunctive norm. So what you observe to what people expect of you. And so this new status quo reaches a point of self-reinforcing equilibrium. And that's when you know you've generated a new norm and you've actually hit all of your checklists um, for social norm creating uh, items. So we've made the ask easy, we've made it unambiguous, we've communicated these benefits and we've generated an, an impression that everyone expects compliance. And so this is one part of our last phase where we actually create a big mural in the communities where people can identify with what a, being a farmer means and really see the benefits. So not just farmers see this, everyone in the community sees this. So again, this is a recap of our Lens for Life program. Um, just like the program that was before, it's actually ongoing right now. And we are uh, experimentally testing it. Like we said, behavioral science is data-driven. Um, so we will be publishing the, the final results at some point in the coming years. Obviously things have slowed down with um, COVID, but we are in the middle of the program. Um, so, so it's been ongoing, we have really positive results, and that's been great. And for everyone who's been listening, if there are three things that I can ask everyone to try and retain uh, at the end of this, are just the three insights that I had before, and thinking about how we can address these with different behavioral interventions, as opposed to just paying people, um, teaching people how to do things with information, or policing people. And so again, we have a limited slash bound cognitive resource available to us. So using simplified information delivered at a timely moment um, is great. We are uncertainty averse. So here risk or ambiguity. So let's try to make things feel less uncertain by giving people social proof, uh, proof that it works in their community for people like them. And we are social beings. So social norms will either work with you or against you. So it's always good to try and engage with norm changing activities using that little checklist um, I had before. And for anyone who's interested in kind of adopting this way of thinking, uh, generating basically program insights from behavioral science, we actually have a platform um, called behavior.rare.org where we try and help practitioners um, gain, learn from these insights and really apply them to their work. Um, so it's a great platform, it's free. Um, so anyone who can join you can also get connected with a behavioral scientist. And we also have these two guides, which are basically recaps of all the behavioral evidence that exists in the field. Uh, one of the topics is literally in agriculture, so that's great. And then we also have a guide on how to apply behavioral science in practice, covering all the different frameworks that exist, not just ours, um, so that you guys can pick and have the most informed view of behavioral science when you apply to your work. Um, so that is it for me. And I thank great, you for great listening. Philippe. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to tell everyone we're going to be probably about three minutes late because I want to ask you some questions. Um, sure. So if people could just stick, hold in and we won't be very late after uh, the finish of our hour. So, um, but Philippe, you've got a couple of questions here. Um, here we go. Here's one here. Hi, Philippe. I remember in an earlier discussion around farmer behavior and willingness to change, trust was a cross-cutting issue, right? So right can i trust the information the extension agent is providing me or will this work for me do you think this is a big part of the emotional appeals and how do we overcome this 
Definitely. So actually, it's good that you bring that up. In Colombia, um, we found trust to be a really, really big problem. And that kind of results from obviously the conflict that they've had ongoing for the last half century. And um, so they don't necessarily always trust external sources. And here, overgeneralizing, but in Norte de Santander, we saw that a lot. Um, and so that's why the social proof aspect is really, really important. It's the same way as people don't necessarily want to buy electric cars or solar power until they see like their neighbor trying it. You can see all the information that scientists tell you or extension agents tell you, uh, but you might not necessarily be the person who's willing to take the risk. But seeing other people succeed and benefit from it is then going to reinforce that, that trust you have in the information if it's people in your community. So that's really something we're trying to hit. And obviously we adapt that when we go to different communities. Excellent. Um, another question here. Uh, thanks for your presentation. It's very informative for me. I have a question. How do you identify which farmers belong to which of these three group, groups of adopters? It's the low resistance, the medium resistance and the high resistance. Great question. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and that's actually a question that, that we always grapple with when we go to different areas. Um, the way we design the program is not necessarily that we impose that title on people. It's more of a self-selection mechanism, if you want. So when we get to an area, um, we don't define people as low-resistance farmers. What happens is we just accept the people that want to join the program and find those are going to be low-resistance farmers for us. And they probably are because they're joining with minimal evidence. Um, and so it's a continuum, like I was saying. And for us, it helps to think of it in the way that we structured the program. But it's more when they interact with us. That, that tells us a bit more of how much utility they put on switching or how much disutility they would put on switching. So, so it's more an indicator of how resistant they are as opposed to who they are as a person, because there are very different groups that fit in each of these broad categories. And do you find, do you think that smallholder farmers are more in one of these groups than the others? Do they, do they seem to be more um, high resistance on average or is it just a mix? What, yeah, what do you find? What we're seeing right now is um, and we've been lucky. In one of the areas we've been working with, there is actually a big push from the community to, to be sustainably minded. Um, so there we had a lot of what we would call low resistance farmers. Um, but actually in the newest region we are, we get a lot of MRF, so the, the medium resistance farmers. And so we didn't have a huge chunk of the population join initially, but the social marketing is proven to be very, very effective. Um, so so yeah, there's no clear distinction or why would it be a problem if, if one happens or not. We just need to basically be adaptable. And because we have um, this SMS platform, we are able to cater to varying sizes and populations. Um, so yeah, I know it doesn't necessarily answer the, the whole question. Um, no, no, that's great. No, I was just wondering if they different. were more conservative on average. Um, I think a question here is that... Um, how, how important is it, or perhaps valuable, particularly in smallholder farmer uh, context, to try community approaches then to pest management and behavioral change? Yeah, so, so we find the main reason why we turned to actually behavioral science for this program was that the traditional ways of doing things just weren't really succeeding. So you would either get a few people adopt perfectly or, but the norm would always be fighting against you. Um, so we identified the norm as being a big problem, and that's why behavioral science was a really big tool for us, and using these levers was very important. Um, not saying that it's the best solution for every situation, you usually need a mix of everything, uh, but if yeah. you're facing norms, which we usually are in agriculture, um, it is important to understand how to interact with them and how to change them if necessary. Um, Excellent. And, and just, just one last question on that, I guess it's related. How important is it to consider gender yeah, no, definitely. Um, so that's actually why our, the social proof approach we have is so generalizable and adaptable to different places. Um, obviously, you want proof of people that are most like you. Um, and so if you only have men, then obviously the women will feel left out. If you only have people in high positions of power in the community, people in lower positions of power will feel left out. Uh, so when we get to an area, actually, we do have a bit more money on the sides to try and target people. Uh, that might be in different groups that we identify. And so that's something we have been doing, um, trying to get a really broad swat of the population to hit this. And um, also our tech platform allows us to deliver information that might be more necessary to some groups than others, and we can tailor that. Um, so that has been how we address this. Uh, but obviously what we're really excited about is seeing our big pilot initially, did it affect people differently? And how can we alleviate that in future versions of this program? 
Um, so that's something we keep in mind. Thank you so much. And thank you. That was a very uh, fascinating presentation. Uh, and it was actually a very nice sort of ending to the other three very good presentations, sort of a slightly different viewpoint, but um, really sort of tied up some of those questions as well that we had previously. So thank you very much, Philippe, for joining us. And I, I hope you'll join us again in the future because uh, we'd like